Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, we welcome a guest that is widely known in the Oregon startup community, the founder of Pi, which stands for the Portland Incubator Experiment. And that is what I will focus on today, business incubators. What are business incubators and why should an entrepreneur care? A business incubator is an organization that helps startup companies and individual entrepreneurs to develop their businesses by providing a full-scale range of services, starting with management training and office space and ending with venture capital financing. Now, the strategy behind the creation of an incubator can vary widely, from physical spaces like a conference room or a virtual space like a Zoom call. However, the group intends to assemble makes little difference because the strategy remains the same. Jumpstart a business model that already exists. Possibly the best known incubators in the academic world is Stanford's D School. The D School, according to their mission statement, helps people develop their creative abilities. It's a place, a community, and a mindset. In short, it is an eight-course business incubator. So how does this all work? As I mentioned, these incubators help support the development of startups through mentorship and advisories and administrative support. According to the International Business Innovation Association, an incubator's primary objective is to produce successfully and financially viable firms that can survive on their own. These incubators are here to help the local economy and entrepreneurs succeed. From financial management like understanding overhead expenses such as utilities, office equipment rentals, and reception services, to management support, tapping into mentors and advisors' network of entrepreneurs, executives, and venture capitalists. However, a business incubator does not need to be a formal establishment. In fact, an incubator could be established right where you are listening to this podcast right now. A car, a gym, work. The goal is to surround oneself with experts who have an expertise and who are willing to help in the space of the business you are trying to grow. And these professionals do not need to be in the same industry. For example, one of my best friends works in the shoe industry. I work in healthcare. We bounce ideas off each other all the time because of the different perspectives on businesses. I want to ask him questions that are challenging to me to see what solutions he may think of. For me, it is like gaining access to a professional resource because the way the shoe industry may solve problems may not be the same way as the healthcare industry. Take an NFL player, for example. Many of these individuals will take up boxing during the offseason. Why? Because NFL players are looking to gain insight and endurance, how to avoid getting hit, footwork techniques when in the pocket, hand speed when blocking. That is what an incubator is, cross-training with other professionals. Knowing we do not know everything as an entrepreneur is important, and we must be willing to reach out to other professionals for help. Players like Russell Westbrook and Mark Ingram are not paying Freddie Roach to punch another player wearing a helmet. They're learning new skills that are applicable to their professional success. So get out there. Network with professionals outside your profession. Ask questions to problems that may be difficult to solve. Heck, ask questions to problems you have already solved. That's the point of an incubator. Share ideas with others to make them better. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My 
My next guest has been around the Portland startup community for more than 25 years. From built Oregon to Oregon Storyboard, Silicon Forest to TechFest Northwest, please welcome the founder of Portland Incubator Experiment, Rick Tarosi. Today, I am very excited because I have a Portland startup legend. Rick Tarosi, are you with me? Rick, how are you doing? I am here. Thank you for having me. I don't. I don't know that I'm a legend, but <laughs> definitely, definitely a myth. Well, I just, I just, sort. I just anointed you right there as a legend. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So thank you very much uh, for joining us on the show, because I think you have a lot okay. of a lot of information to provide, not only myself, but our listeners uh, as well. So first, mm-hmm. let's kind of just introduce the world to Rick. So uh, Rick Tarosi, most well known as the co-founder and general manager of Pi here in town, which is an early stage startup accelerator. Uh, I likewise grew up as an army brat. I kind of spent time all over and um, spent grade school in, in Stuttgart, Germany, uh, spent kind of junior high and high school years in southern Idaho, and went to college in uh, southeastern Washington, and then wound up moving to Portland in the mid-90s, where I kind of fell in with the startup community here, and I've been working in, on, and around it ever since. Awesome. So Germany, what took you out to Germany? Uh, my dad was stationed out there for about four and a half years. So we were, we were on a, an army base. It was a, a U.S. army base, but got to spend a lot of time not only exploring Germany, but getting the chance to explore Europe and Northern Africa, which was really, really informative for me at a very young age about the world being much bigger and, and diverse place than just my, my lived experience. Definitely. And you know, that, I think that's kind of important too. I tend to talk about that often of just cultural experience and how much you grow, mm-hmm. you know, during those opportunities. Yep. You know, one of the things you mentioned is, you know, when you kind of moved here to the Oregon, you got, you got into the startup community. Let's, let's kind of talk about that a little bit. How did you get into the startup community here in this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was purely accidental. Like I had, I realized people had started companies, right? Like I, I knew somebody had to start like, Coca-Cola right. and, and, you know, Microsoft or whatever. But it really, that was something that people kind of actively did. And so I wasn't necessarily looking for that. I was just a, a recent college grad looking for a job. And I'd been an English major and wound up just applying to this role where they needed somebody to be kind of a, a copywriter editor. And that was at a very small agency. And that agency was doing a lot of work for these very early stage startups. And one of those startups I, I hit it off with and they were like, look, why are we paying the agency to pay you? Why don't you just come work for us? And so I went over to work for that company. It's called Medical Logic. And um, they were very early in the electronic medical record space back in the day. Oh, okay. And went over there to work for them as kind of a copywriter editor, but wound up kind of becoming the, for lack of a better term, the kind of deck presentation person for them. And so I got to spend a lot of time with the the founder of the company and the executive team and kind of learning how that kind of stuff worked for venture funded startups. And then that company wound up going through an IPO during the dot-com days and living through the dot-com bust. So I think I learned more in the 18 months at that company than I've learned in the, the 25 years following. Oh, wow. Interesting. It's kind of funny yeah. how like one, you know, opportunity like that, you tend to learn quite a bit. And, and I think it's because we were working like 20 hours a day too. <laughs> that was probably part of it. We crammed a lot of learning into a very short period of time. Well, it's interesting too, because you kind of mentioned you, you kind of fell into this, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was no grand plan. I mean, if you, if you look back at my career, there's, there's definitely a through line there, but but only looking backwards, like there's never been, everything's just been kind of, a, I always refer to it as a series of happy accidents where, mm-hmm. you know, I happen to know somebody or happen to notice somebody doing something or happen to notice a gap in the community and just kind of took the opportunity to either, you know, go work with somebody else or, or start something new. And, and that's kind of been my career path up till now. It seems to me, you know, I've, I've been able to see from the outside looking in a lot of your work it seems to me that you have a lot of passion for what you're doing, like a lot of passion for the startup community. Did you end up growing a passion for it as you were, you're working into it or have you always kind of thought about it? 
it, more it's a learned passion and there's definitely passion I'm, I'm not in it for the money that's for sure um the opportunity to work with really driven intelligent creative people who are trying to either bring something new to fruition or trying to change the world in some way mm -hmm. and being some small part of that journey is a really um really rewarding experience for me i just i get a lot of emotional satisfaction out of that i had actually tried to start a couple of my own companies back in the day and discovered that i just wasn't really founder material i wasn't i wasn't driven and passionate the same way that founders were but i was a really good tactical support or sounding board for those founders and so i kind of fell into that role and and that's the role i enjoy most and looking back kind of at my life you know as a college lacrosse coach i was a literary agent and an editor for a while um and then this kind of like copywriting editing storytelling for startups just to help me realize that i'm really good at helping somebody else get better or be better at what they do mm -hmm. and and that's what i really enjoy doing nice in fact you enjoy it so much you, you created this company called pi so let's, let's talk about yeah. pie. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's tell the listeners at home, what is pie and, and kind of what does it do? Yeah. So at its very most basic, pie is really this ongoing experiment to figure out how established organizations like corporations or government entities or educational institutions can more effectively collaborate specifically with the Portland startup community and, and collaborate for mutual benefit. So we're not looking for, you know, something that only the startups are going to get something out of or something that only the businesses are going to get something out of, but we really want to see that collaboration be fruitful on both sides. And so the, the project originally started with a company headquartered here in town called Widening Kennedy, which, you know, folks here are familiar with, but for folks outside the area who might not be familiar with Widen, they are a global advertising agency that has done a lot of big brand advertising, mostly in television. So, for example, they're the company that came up with Nike Just Do It. They're the Coca-Cola Polar Bears. They're the new Colonel Sanders for KFC. They're the old Spice Guy. Like they do, they do storytelling with brands that have a ton of brand equity, but may have potentially lost their voice, and and they kind of help redefine and recreate that voice. And the, the reason that Wyden was interested in starting the project was they saw startups and technology as kind of this new new bastion of creative expression and they wanted to be involved in the Portland community in that regard mostly to learn and and kind of kind of figure out how startups did what they did but also really to give back to the community and to kind of pay it forward to to help the next generation of businesses here so pi started as a co-working space it was just a bunch of us uh startup types kind of sitting in a three thousand square foot concrete floor kind of very sparsely appointed uh <laughs> former retail space in the Lightning Kennedy building. The heat didn't even work the oh, first man. year we were in there. So it's a so it's a really good kind of like uphill in the snow both ways kind of startup story. Um but what we discovered was that while having founders sit next to one another and that, that level of peer support and emotional support was really effective, mm -hmm. there's still there still were gaps in the knowledge and so we kind of you know tweak the program a little bit to to be more of a startup accelerator and by that we mean an environment where founders not only support one another but they're also provided with very intensive mentorship from experts in the community or, or in that case from around the world to kind of help them figure out like, are they building the right thing? Should they be doing something different? Should they stop doing what they're doing? And really, really help them figure out the business aspects of what they're trying to pursue. So if, if 
an individual, you know, listening wants to get involved with yeah. Pi or is interested in how, how do they get involved? How do they kind of find out this more information about Pi? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are a few different ways. Um, we try and do a lot of kind of open community facing events to kind of help people engage at that level or learn more about the project, be it, you know, Q and a, or just kind of social uh, events and, and, you know, obviously virtual mm -hmm. these days, but um, networking events and that sort of thing. Uh, we, if they're, if they're building something and we focus on three specific areas. So we focus on, Software as a service, web-based, mobile-based kind of applications. We have a partnership with Autodesk here in town that focuses on hardware or oh, nice. manufactured objects. Mm -hmm. And then through our partnership with Built Oregon, we work on consumer products as well. So very product-oriented kind of companies. But um, if folks are working on something like that, we open up applications once a year and uh, kind of try and figure out a cohort of companies to put together in each of those verticals and then work with those companies. These days, it's it's usually four to six months that we work with those companies. And mm -hmm. in the old world, they all sat in the same space. These days, it's a, it's a fully virtual program, mm -hmm. but we're hoping to get back to in-person. And then um, another way, if you're not working on anything, but you're like, hey, I like startups, so I want to help. We also are always on the lookout for people who are willing to mentor our startups. Nice. And uh, mentorship for us, I think it's it's important to be explicit about it. Mentorship for us is, is simply listening and then providing your opinion. There's not, you know, you're not doing work for free. You're not... Um, you know, you're not being tasked with getting something done. It's really just providing your opinion from your area of expertise to kind of help the founders figure stuff out. Nice. You know, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning of this is focusing on the community, right? And kind of doing the grassroots efforts with the community. Why is community involvement so important to you? You never know what a relationship is going to turn into mm, yeah. and so much of my life has been based on these random connections I've made and and they're not I often worry that in the business world relationships become very transactional and I think the thing I like about community is you can have an affinity for someone else or share common interests whether there are business outcomes from that common interest or not, or you can kind of develop those relationships. And I always feel like a community is only as strong as its weakest connection. And so, mm, you know, yeah. kind of helping to inform those connections, helping to kind of, kind of, um, you know, introduce people or make sure that people are getting introduced and making sure that there's no single point of failure in the community and that a variety of people can connect a variety of other people. I think it's really the magic that, that definitely makes the startup world work. And I would like to believe that it helps the, the broader world work as yeah. well. Yeah. Now, now you, you, so you have pie, right. And you, you're working with the community, but that's not really all Rick does, right. You've, you've also done a <laughs> Ted talk, right. You, you, I believe yeah, you, uh, yeah. You write a blog. So what? Let, let's talk about the TED Talk, though. I, would, I was very interested. I actually watched it. Would love to kind of yeah. give the listeners at home just kind of a synopsis. Yeah, so the synopsis is um, I'm an introvert. I'm probably the last person you would think of to be kind of <laughs> fulfilling this role of meeting new people constantly and, and trying to get them connected. But, the you know, the synopsis of the talk is the introverts bring a unique skill set to doing this work and um, as the extroverts. And I'm not arguing that one is better than another. I think it's just non-obvious that introverts can be good at this kind of work. Yeah. And it's really just the idea that, you know, everyone listening to this podcast knows someone that someone else should know. And it's really our yeah. obligation as humans to ensure those connections are happening. So, you know, being thoughtful, about uh, connecting people and and really taking the opportunity to take a risky you know call out of the blue or email out of the blue because you never know 
what that may result in. Yeah. And, and for those listening at home, um, you, you, you can Google it. Rick Trozzi, an introvert's guide to building community. It really is a, a very, very cool um, kind of discussion about how it, how important it is to kind of build the network of community and, and kind of put the pieces together. And this is really kind of why. Yeah, I, yeah, I was just going to say, and I, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say, I felt really lucky to have that opportunity and, and really enjoyed the whole experience. And I look forward to never ever having to do that again because standing <laughs> on stage alone in front of 3000 people in person and who knows how many people were watching on live stream oh, yeah. was the most frightening, frightening experience I've ever been. <laughs> well, you know, maybe we'll get that med- listeners listen to this podcast at some point, but I don't know. We'll get to that. Who knows? But I really did enjoy it because it is, it was very unique because it really kind of, it kind of it really bridges what I'm trying to do with the podcast, right? And that's really kind of to mm-hmm. showcase the entrepreneurs and build up our community. You know, America's built on the small business kind of philosophy. Now, yep. what you know with Pi and all of your kind of interactions, what have you like uh, from an entrepreneur's perspective? What have you kind of what what has been some aha moments, like things maybe that have kind of mm-hmm. mm, I didn't know that about this world. Yeah, I think early in my career with startups, I was very much a perfectionist and would would wait until like everything was perfect before mm-hmm. releasing it or talking about it or that kind of thing. And I think one of the first learnings I, I had with the startup community was, you know, get it out there get it in front of people. And I think, you know, you had uh, Juan Barraza on the the podcast and he mentioned something similar, which is like, talk to people. Like I think so often founders are, you know, timid about sharing their ideas or they're concerned that someone might take their idea when in reality, it's worse to kind of keep it to yourself. Like the more you put it out there, the more feedback you'll get, um, the better product you'll develop in the long run, the better company you'll develop in the long run. And again, much like building community, you'll never know who you're going to mention it to that's going to say, oh, you know, I have the perfect person for you. Or I know somebody else who's working in that space who could be really helpful. Or I have a customer for you. So just getting out there, talking about it, even if there's nothing built yet, even if it's still just an idea, that's really important to do that kind of work and, um, and kind of be out and about and participating in the community because you never know where your co-founder is going to come from. You never know where your first employee is going to come from or your first investor, if you choose to go that route. So don't, don't be shy about sharing your idea. Don't be shy about getting out into the community. Don't think there's some barrier or hurdle that you have to cross before you start participating in the community sooner, sooner rather than later is always better. Yeah, that's, that's a great you know advice. And not only that, but what advice would you have for the, the introverts that do have the idea that, you know, how did you kind of ov- overcome the ability to do a TED talk, right? You know, as an introvert, I think yeah. sometimes that's very difficult. How how did you overcome that? I, you know, it, it took a lot of work and it's been amazing to me during the pandemic that all of these years of effort to like deal with kind of social awkwardness and social anxiety that I have personally have now completely eroded because I've been, you know, just working solo for you know, my desk for so long. Um, but I think it's really important to, and this is something I always try and remind myself, don't feel obligated to do everything and look for ways to engage that match the way you enjoy expressing yourself. So for me at the beginning, that was a lot less about going to meetings or like talking to a lot of people. And it was just me writing online because I enjoyed writing. And so that was a very easy way to kind of put myself out there in the community in a way that was comfortable to me. This podcast is another example, right? Like you do a great job of interviewing people and bringing on interesting guests and exposing different, you know, different facets of the community. And I can tell you enjoy this format for doing that work. And and that comes through in the work you do. And for some people, that's 
Instagram or TikTok. For other people, it's, you know, going to a bunch of meetups. Um, but I think you just need to choose a venue or medium that best match, best matches your way of expressing yourself and then don't overdo it. I think is the other part. It's really easy to get burnt out on trying to do too much. So kind of ease into it. None of us who, you know, seem to be anywhere and everywhere started that way. We all started in one spot and kind of once we kind of mastered that section, then we kind of added something else on and so on and so on. Yeah. Um, it's incremental and it takes time. But, you know, don't try and do everything all at once or, or it won't work out well. Definitely. And and thank you for the kind words. I, I do really enjoy this and I always enjoy the individuals coming on my show because they do provide such a very diverse um, kind of vision and, and um, kind of view of what entrepreneurship is in the state of Oregon. Yeah. Right. And it, it is diverse. Yeah. There, there's a lot. In fact, you mentioned something right now during discussing that you also are a writer. In fact, you, you're the Silicon mm -hmm. florist. I believe it is. Yeah. How did yeah. how did you get into blogging? So, yeah, I, <laughs> I, uh, I honestly don't know. So I, you know, I was an English major. I, I thought I wanted to be a writer. And then I was a literary agent for two years. And I was like, this business is awful. Like, you know, why would I ever want to be this business? And, and I never really wanted to be a journalist. Um, funny enough, uh, kind of tangent, uh, Mike Lagaway, who is the tech reporter for the Oregonian here, he and I actually went to college together. He was a, he was a history major, um, but it's just kind of odd that we both wound up kind of covering the same stuff here in town. <laughs> and I wound up working for, back in the day, it was called The Mining Company, and then it became about dot com and that the focus of that site was it was kind of an early version of Wikipedia where they would pick experts and say you focus on this particular topic and like build out basically a blog and a newsletter and a website about this about this product and so or the, about this topic and so that is really where I began and then I just thought like well if I can do this for somebody else I can do this on my own and you know, started working. That was like the late nineties. Like there weren't really blogging platforms. You kind of still had to like write code from scratch to put mm. stuff online. So mm. I started doing that. And then that kind of morphed into a couple other blogs. And, and it really, you know, it was just really a good way for me to express myself, whether anyone was reading it or not. Uh, spoiler alert, no one was reading it. I was reading it. Maybe, Maybe my mom every once in a while, but no one else is reading those blogs. And then, you know, it dawned on me that it was, well, it was all well and good to like spout my opinion out into the ether. I could probably be doing more with that type of effort. And that's really when I hit upon the idea for Silicon Forest. I'd been spending a lot of time with the open source community in Portland. And, and if people aren't familiar with the concept of open source, there, you know, there's proprietary software, which is, we're going to build this thing and sell it to you, but you can't see any of the code or how it works or any of that other kind of stuff. And then there's open source, which is anybody and everybody can see how it's built. People can contribute to improving it or fixing bugs or that kind of thing. And it's really this, how do we work together to build the best product possible? And so that community was really robust in Portland at that point in time. And I wasn't a talented enough developer to contribute to any of the projects. <laughs> so my opinion was like, well, I'll just open source my marketing communications knowledge and I'll just start promoting what I see happening in Portland. And that was really the light bulb moment where suddenly I've doubled my readership overnight because not only did I continue to kind of read my own blog, but suddenly whoever I wrote about was really interested in the fact that I wrote about their stuff and, and that that felt validating and, and motivating for folks. And that was really the aha moment for me was, you know, how do I help encourage folks to continue pursuing what 
what they want to pursue and and to let them know that they're being seen and that there were value there was value to what they were doing and I could do that through my writing and now it's just you know that was 14 years ago that I started it and now so now it's just like a bad habit like I probably couldn't <laughs> stop even if I wanted to you know one of the things we we've kind of mentioned quite a bit you you're dual you do a lot of different things, right? You're in the startup community, you're blogging, right? You're, you've done the TED Talk. But one of the things you also do a lot is you you mentor a lot of these, you know, inspiring entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And one of the things mm-hmm. I've heard you state um, often is, is burnout uh, in the tech community mm-hmm. in particular. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that a little bit because I think it's kind of important that we need to, the listeners need to know that this is, this one is an issue, right? That we yeah. have, that this is an issue we need to collectively work to resolve, but then how can we help resolve it? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. So when I started in startups, even to the point where we started Pi, like startups weren't part of popular culture. Like you were still, you were still crazy to be doing something like that. You know, people were like, go get a day job. What are you doing? Why would you start your own thing? And at that point in time, burnout was still a reality, but less so. And and I think what we've seen over the past decade or so is you know, through things like Shark Tank or kind of like, you know, venture capital becoming this almost celebrity status kind of pursuit. We've really seen startups become part of popular culture and almost be a rite of passage, like, you know, being in a garage band or buying your first car. Like it's it's that thing you should do, you know, while you're young to kind of, yeah, like figure that out, like try that. And, and, and it's not, it, it's still crazy to do startups, but it's not as crazy as it used to be. Um, and so because of that, the negative side of that um, kind of willingness to do startups is there's this like mythology of the, you know, the, the founder who's, who's always hustling or the, you know, the, that a company can only be built through raising venture capital or, you know, if you're not building a unicorn, it's not worth pursuing right. what you're doing. And I think those those kind of negative aspects, that kind of like mythological aspect is really the stuff that leads to burnout because yeah. that's not reality. Like nobody builds a company on their own. Yeah. And, you know, nobody nobody works, you know, I can say through experience, no one works 20 hours a day and is, is successful in the long run. Mm-hmm. Like that, those are just all paths to um, negatively impacting what you want to build. And then I think also looking at the aspect of, you know, founders have a lot of mental, emotional, and behavioral stressors and and suffer from a lot of behavioral anguish in that regard because it is really stressful and it's really lonely and you know even though another founder can kind of understand what you're going through as a founder you're always going through it alone and no one can truly understand it and so i think the other aspect we've been trying to look at is just like how do we develop a healthier environment in a supportive environment where people can, people still need to hustle and they still need to do the work, but they don't need to do it at the expense of their physical or mental yeah, health. Definitely. That, that's great advice, you know, and I think, I mean, throughout this conversation, you've provided some amazing nuggets of information for the listeners. In fact, you know, for those inspiring entrepreneurs at home, you know, that are interested in starting a business or thinking about going down this route of the startup community, what should they be thinking about? When what what advice could you give them to kind of just be mindful of, or maybe some good nuggets of? Hey, go down this route. You've already provided a lot of great stuff, but maybe maybe some good golden nuggets for those folks at home that are thinking about getting into this this startup community world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I think the, you know there's a there's the argument that like our founders made or our founders born kind of thing. Like I I'm a firm believer that this is behavior that can be learned. Mm -hmm. I think there's an important aspect of it, which I was never able to really conquer, which is the, you have to balance the, a good founder is quite capable of balancing this kind of world changing vision, which is the thing that inspires them or gets them out of bed every morning 
they're able to balance that with very tactical, like, what are we getting done today? What are we getting done in the next hour? How are we, how are we pushing this company forward? How are we getting closer to achieving that vision? And good founders are, are able to kind of balance both sides of their brain in that regard. I was never visionary. And so I was really good at the tactical side. And I was like, I can, I can bang this stuff out or I can fight this fire and I can get this stuff done. But I was more inspired by the tactical aspects than, mm -hmm. than the visionary aspects. Good founders definitely have both. And then I think the other aspect that I see most commonly holding folks back, especially in the tech space, is this assumption that they can only start a kind of acquiring customers or building community once they've built the product or once they've built the first version of the product. And so what I always try and encourage people to do is figure out ways to start engaging that customer base or to start interacting with the, that community before you even build anything. So yeah. like by way of example, if you can go out, you know, with this idea or this, this community that you want to build and you know, get 25,000 people signed up for your newsletter, I'm pretty convinced that you're going to be able to build a product that is going to address the needs of that community. Or if you can get a bunch of people following you on Twitter or in conversations about that topic or following your podcast, like don't think you have to build something new to get the process started. You really need to like demonstrate your understanding of the people who will eventually be your customers or your community. And the sooner you start that, even if it's just a handful of folks, even if it's like a really discreet group of folks you're solving a problem for, that's better than waiting until you build your product. Um, that's the, you know, because either you know, you're capable of building a product and, you know, it's going to take you a while to get there. Or the other thing we see quite often is, you know, somebody with an idea that is convinced that they need to find like a, a technical co-founder to build the idea before they even begin the process. And that's just, that's, that's just dangerous. Like that's really hard to do. And, and anybody can start a newsletter. Yeah. Anybody yeah. can start a podcast. Yeah. So like figure out how to do that, figure out how to start engaging with your market before you worry too much about what product you're actually building. Definitely. And if, Hey, if I can start a podcast, anybody can start a podcast. <laughs> and you know, one of the things you said that's so important too is, is knowing the consumer and knowing their needs. Uh, you know, we've heard this so mm -hmm. many times on this podcast is the, the need to really know what the, what the consumer is willing to buy and what they're willing to pay for it. Because you may yep. be working on a product like we you know talk about Steve Jobs and he, he his first Apple computer that he made the supercomputer, but nobody bought it in the eighties because it right. was so advanced right. and, and he didn't really know why. And it was like, well, we didn't need that yet, right? But now everybody is like waiting for the new innovative thing, right? Um, but yeah. at, at that time, innovation yeah. it was just too innovative. Uh, but you know, looking um, well, uh, and the, the other part of it, and I just don't want to lose this because I think you touched on something really important. I think he he and Apple weren't at that time had the ability to not be precious with that concept. And I think that's another thing that a lot of founders stumble over where they're like, well, it was my idea to build this product to do X and mm, customers yeah. seem to be doing Y with it. And rather than focus on what the customers want mm -hmm. to do with the product, mm -hmm. they remain kind of like, obsessed with what they want yep. the product to do or what they design the product to do, you always have to listen to the market and just kind of figure out where the market is taking it. You can look at it, you know, a wide variety of products that are super popular now that I mean, Twitter is a good example. Like Twitter started as a, as a way just to let friends know, like, are you at work or are you at lunch? Yeah. <laughs> and people are like, well, I could, I could do some other stuff with this. So, so don't, uh, yeah, again, don't be too precious with your concept. Like definitely get it out there, but be willing to change course if the market tells you something different yeah. is needed. That's a great point. I mean, like Instagram, when it first came out, I felt like that was almost used religiously to show me what you were eating that day. <laughs> it was just a bunch of food I mean, photos. That, that's 
That's a great example because Instagram, <laughs> the, only, the only reason I know this is because uh, the first community manager for or the, the first person who's kind of dealing with community for Instagram went to read and we had some readies in Pi at the time. And so he would be in Pi from time to time just kind of hanging out. Instagram was originally called Bourbon. It was spelled you can look it up. It's like B-U-R-B-N, like some of the vowels were missing. But Bourbon was originally, if people remember Foursquare, which was like a where are you kind of check-in yeah. app, Bourbon was originally a, a Foursquare competitor. And and what they discovered was they're like, wait, people are using this an awful lot to take photos and put filters on those photos. Maybe we just focus on that. Interesting. Instead. And then, then it became Instagram. And that, see, again, it's, it's, it's when the founder notices that and pivots, right. Is it's, it's important, but it's also yeah. important. You know, you mentioned something too, during that advice um, that you're giving is it's okay if you're not a founder as well, right? Yeah, Fine. Totally. You can find other areas, you know, I'm not a founder, but I'm, I'm definitely mm-hmm. hoping I can help some people find either their passion or maybe get intrigued or inspired to do entrepreneurial things to really help boost their local economy and help them, right? Find their passion in, in what they want to do. But you don't yep. have to be a founder to be an entrepreneur, right? There's, there's, you can be so many different things and you can still, you know, be an entrepreneur just doing different things. Yeah. Well, and some of my um, most rewarding collaborations that I've had the chance to experience through Pi have been with, people who are terribly entrepreneurial within like a much larger corporation. Yep. Like they, corporate opportunity. They, yep. They, yeah. They still had that passion and that kind of vision. They just happen to be working for, you know, a publicly traded company or yep. whatever, but you can still, you can still use those skills in really meaningful ways, no matter what you're pursuing. That's very true. So Rick, looking back on everything, you know, looking back on going to school, growing up in Germany, Pie, TED Talks, you know, writing blogs, all of it. What advice would you give your younger self? Hmm. You know, I think the, the, the one that held me back the most and that I kind of touched on earlier is it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, no one's paying as much attention to the stuff as you are, and no one has the same level of expectations that, that you're kind of holding yourself to. So let go of it being perfect and just work toward good enough. Like get it done, get it out there, get it in front of people, and, and see what happens. Man, that is great advice. In fact, Advice I might even take myself. <laughs> Rick, thank you again so you'll much. Notice, you'll, you'll, notice this, you'll notice this podcast episode was not edited at all. We just put it out because yep. it was good enough. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Terosi, thank you again so much. The co-founder of, of Pi. Thank it's you. been such a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.